Well, the last few weeks we've been uh, studying through Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. Uh, we're going through chapter by chapter, uh, trying to do it verse by verse as much as possible. Uh, we've covered the first three chapters. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 is what we've covered uh, in the earlier Sundays. Of course, all the um, recordings of these messages are available freely online on our church website. Uh, so you're, uh, we encourage you to um, uh, download it, listen to it online, use the sermon notes that are available uh, for your personal study. So we're going to pick up uh, today in chapter 4, and we're going to cover chapters 4 and chapter 5 today uh, from God's Word. First Corinthians chapters 4 and 5. Uh, just to quickly uh, review a, a few points uh, from the earlier chapters. Uh, we mentioned that the Apostle Paul is writing to the to believers, to the church in Corinth, approximately seven years after he had established this church. So he's writing to them after a time gap. Uh, by this time, uh, of course, the church is, you know, is experiencing a wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, there are a lot of problems that have uh, risen in this congregation among these people. Uh, Paul has received news about it, and so he's writing uh, back to the church to address some of these issues. Uh, keep in mind that all of this is done by the Holy Spirit. So it's not Paul's own, you know, ideas that he's writing back, but it's the Holy Spirit writing through the Apostle Paul, addressing things in the local church there at Corinth. And and as Paul opens up first uh, his first uh uh, at the beginning of this letter, he's writing to all who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it applies to you and me today. In chapter 1, he recognized the good things God has done in the church. Uh, he's pointed them to the gospel. The, the message of the cross of Christ, which is the power of God and it is the wisdom of God. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul uh, talks about the mysteries of God which have been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. So he says the Holy Spirit has revealed to us this mystery which was kept hidden through the ages for us. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals this to us. The Holy Spirit is also the one who reveals uh, the things God has planned for us. The Holy Spirit is also the one who gives us the mind of Christ. Then in chapter 3, Paul addresses the first major issue that he's dealing with, which is that of division in the church in Corinth. If you will remember, uh, Paul addresses this issue because in Corinth, what has happened is uh, there have been different ministers who have come and ministered to them, and unfortunately, the People in the church have started to take sides with different ministers of God. So some people say, I belong to Paul. Some people say, I belong to Apollos. Some people are saying, no, I belong to Peter. And so they began to take sides. And this has caused division or disunity in the local congregation. So he's addressed that in chapter 3. And he's, he shared the word, uh, shared what the Holy Spirit wants them to hear on how to deal with uh, disunity in the church. So we pick up from there. Uh, in chapter 4, and we have broken chapter 4 into uh, four sections for our study. Uh, first of all, uh, in verses 1 and 2, he, uh, we look at the fact that God's ministers are servants and stewards. Uh, in verses 3 to 6, we, uh, he shares with us on how to judge and honor uh, the servants of God. Uh, in verses 7 to 13, he mentions about the challenges of his own apostleship and how he served God's people. Uh, and in verses 14 to 21, we see the heart of a true spiritual father. So that's how we've broken this chapter. Let's look at the first two verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, the verses will not come up on the slides. So I hope you have your Bible, either the print Bible or the Bible on your, uh, your phone that you could follow along. Verses 1 and 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church and says, look guys, uh, the way you should look at us, the way you should perceive uh, Paul, Napolis, and Peter, let a man so consider us, look at us as servants and stewards. Look at us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So that's how we should perceive ministers of God. Look at them as servants of the Lord and as stewards 
of the mysteries of Christ. As servants, it's interesting to see the Greek word that Paul uses there when he refers to himself and Peter and Apollos as servants. He uses a word that literally, uh, in, the, in the context in which it was used, one, it was used to refer to an under rover. Like you had this whole group of people in a galley ship. They were all rowed together under the instruction of a captain. So the captain of the ship gave the orders. They said, go forward. All of them rode forward. Nobody could say, well, I like to go left. <laughs> that was not an option. <laughs> you were an under rover. You were a servant. Of course, you had the freedom to do what you wanted to do. If you wanted to put your row, your oar in a different way and cause trouble, you could. But being on that galley ship, the normal thing was you went in line with the instructions you were given. But that same word was also used to refer to attendants. Attendants who waited upon magistrates or civil servants or uh, even those who waited on kings. Uh, these were people who had freedom to do what they wanted to do, but they chose to be attendants. They chose to serve under somebody else. It, the reason I highlight that is because he could have used a different word called doulos, which means you're a born slave. That means you had no choice. But here... These are men who chose to be servants. Though they had freedom, they chose to serve in alignment to the instructions they were given. So Paul is saying, you perceive us as servants of the Lord and as stewards. Stewards means you're put in responsibility of something that is not your own. You're managing something for somebody else. That's a steward. So he says, that's who we are. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. And the one thing that God is asking from us is he's asking for us to be faithful. He's not asking for us to be flamboyant. He's not asking for us to be great showmen. <laughs> He's not asking for us to, you know, uh, have huge crowds and this and that. He's simply asking for us to be faithful. That's what God wants of those who are his servants and his stewards. He wants us to be faithful. That's the thing that God is looking for us. And for all of us here, we are servants and we are stewards of what God has put in our lives, what God has given to us. To each one of us, we have something that God has entrusted with us with. And remember, the one thing, the primary thing God wants from you is your faithfulness to what he has put in your hands. Verses 3 to 5. So he says, in view of that, verses 3 onwards, verse 3 to 5, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. And notice what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, it's a, it's, it doesn't matter to me. It's a very small thing. If you, the people, he's saying, if you are going to judge me, or if I'm going to be judged by a human court. He says, for that matter, I don't even judge myself. Actually, he says, I don't, I don't see anything wrong in me. But that isn't something I'm even boasting of. Because what matters to me, he says in verse 5, is the fact that ultimately the Lord is going to come. He's going to put everything out in the light. And he's going to judge everything. And he's going to judge us according to the motives of our hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. So here's the point I want us to understand that Paul is highlighting. He says, look, you know, it really doesn't matter how people estimate you. It really doesn't matter how, what people say about you. Because ultimately... God is going to judge you and me, and he's going to judge us according to the motives of our hearts. So God is not going to judge us by the significance of our work, or by the size of our work, or by the accolades that we receive from man. He's not going to judge us according to that. He's going to judge us according to the motives of our hearts. That means, he's not going to be impressed if I stand before him and say, Lord, I preached 500,000 sermons for you in my lifetime. 
He's not going to be impressed by that. He's going to ask, but why did you preach those 500,000 sermons? What was your motivation behind it? Because he's going to judge us according to the motives of our hearts. Are you with me? You see, when you judge me, you're going to judge me based on performance. Not many people will know the motives of my heart. So he judged me according to performance. But God judges based on the motives of our So why am I doing that? Am I doing it because I want to be popular? Because I want to feel good for myself? Uh, because I want other people to say good things about me? What is the motivation behind it? People may not be able to see it, but the Lord sees it. And the Lord judges us according to the motives of our hearts. You see, we could do a lot of good things, but with wrong motives. We could do the, a lot of right things with wrong motives. And we could get by with the applause of people. But God says, mm -hmm. I'm seeing what's there. <laughs> I see what's behind all of that. I see why you're doing it. Right? And so Paul says that's the real crux of the issue, the crux of the matter. That God is going to judge us according to the motives of our hearts. And therefore, what the, all the other judgments really mean nothing. My own estimation of myself also means nothing. Because even if I, hire, I can rate myself highly, but it amounts to nothing if God finds that a fault in me. Are you with me? So that's how we have to judge and understand the servants of God. Let God deal with those things. So therefore, in verse 6, he says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So he's continuing to dwell on that first issue. The issue of divisiveness. So he's saying, guys, look. And I'm paraphrasing this in modern version, right? <laughs> uh, guys, I, I, all this I've said, and I'm using it to talk about myself and Opolis and Peter and all of us leaders. I, I, I'm putting all this in perspective in view of us. He says, I've said all this because I don't want any one of you to be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Says that's don't do that. I like how the more some of the modern versions say it. The contemporary English version says, "Stop saying that one of us is better than the other." Now the Good News Bible puts it like this: None of you should be proud of one person and despise another. And this is something you and I uh, can really take to heart when it comes to our own local church. You know. Uh, here at APC, on every any given Sunday uh, and in the course of a month, we have at least 11 different people preaching the Word of God. Now, those of you at Central, you're stuck with me. <laughs> I mean, you hear me almost every Sunday. But the reality is there are 10 others also preaching <laughs> God's Word across all our locations. And they are good. You know, we have, you know, Pastor Jay Kumar, Nancy, Manohar. Uh, we have Tarun, we have Melky, we have Sam Matthew, Sam Sushil. Uh, several others preaching on Sunday mornings in other locations. Benny and Jean. And then if you include the others who are our staff who also teach in our Bible college during the week, we have a team of 15 strong people ministering. Right? So you think only one person in APC preaches? No, not true. There's a team of 15 solid people who are ministering the Word of God actively week on week. Right, now, if you add to this 25 life group leaders, you've got a team of 40 people. Because there are 25 life groups led by different people. Are you with me? Now, thank God for that team uh, that's actually ministering the word of God, you know, week on week. Uh, you don't see them on, on this pulpit. That doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, and now each one of us ministers according to the grace given to us. But this truth must be in our hearts and minds. That we must not be proud of one person and despise another. Never say that one of us is better than the other. Because remember, each one of us are still growing. Are you with me? 
Encourage one another. Encourage. We are a team. We're all serving. Each one is gifted differently. Each one is growing in the, in the, in the making their journey. But we are one as a team. And so we support one another. We encourage each other. Amen? And that's what Paul is highlighting here as well. Now, uh, in verse 7, verses 7 through 13. Uh, in verse 7 and 8, Paul, you know, it kind of hits home this truth. He's, let's read verses 7 and 8. He says, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did not indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You're already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign that we might also reign with you. Now, look, look what he's trying to say. You know, so try to imagine this. Imagine the Corinthian church had about 100 people. 25 took sides with Paul. We are Paul's group. 25 took sides with Peter. We are Peter's group. 25 took sides with Apollos. We are Apollos' group. 25, we are the nameless group, whatever, you know. <laughs> so they had these little groups in the church. Now, Paul is challenging them with these three questions. In verse 6, sorry, in verse 7, he says, Who makes you different from the other? Paul's group. What makes you different from Apollos' group? Or Peter's group? Next question. What do you have? That you did not receive. I mean, what can you boast about? Because whatever you have is what you received from God. And next question. If you did indeed receive it, then why boast as though you did not? Say, like, well, you know, what's, what makes you different from the other group? What makes you different from the other person? And what do you have that you didn't receive? Every, each one of us has received from God. And if you've, received, if you've received it, then why, did you, why do you pretend like, like we've got it by our own efforts? You know, we prayed much more than Peter's group. Peter went fishing, man. <laughs> we were praying. You know, or Apollos' group. Man, we were studying. We were looking up the concordances. We were looking at all the cross-references. We were studying, man. That's how we received our revelation. Well, what can you boast about? Because everything you have, you actually received from are you understanding this? He's kind of asking, he's knocking on this with these three questions. Now, uh, you kind of see this happen in Christendom, in the Christian world at large. Now, those of you familiar with what's going on around the Christian world, uh, you know, you'll find that people tend to identify themselves, put labels on themselves by certain streams. It used to be called denominations. Today we use a modern word, streams. Which stream do you belong to? Now, if you are unaware of all this, thank God, in some cases, it's good to be ignorant. <laughs> hey, you are blessed. <laughs> Don't even bother. <laughs> but if in by chance you are familiar with what's going on in the Christian world, you find people, you know, I belong to this stream. Uh, we do it like this. We pray like this. We rock back and forth when we pray. <laughs> the other stream, we rock sideways when we pray. <laughs> the other stream, man, we turn around, we twirl around when we pray. You know, So each stream uh, tries to create their own distinctiveness and their own flavor of how they do the same thing. But look, what makes you really different from the other? What do you have that you didn't receive? We all receive from God's. And if you receive it from God, why do you pretend that you didn't receive it from God as you got it by your own self? Is what Paul is asking. In other words, really, we are not different from each other. We belong together. Are you understanding? So he's dealing with the issue of disunity and divisiveness in the church by pointing and addressing and asking these questions. And then he kind of, you know, it, it almost seems like he's, he's sarcastic. He says, look, Corinthians, you think you're already full, verse 8. Uh, you're already rich. Uh, you're, you're reigning as kings uh, because that's their attitude right now. And he says, I wish you were reigning like kings so we could also have reigned with you. But the fact is you're not. It's a little sarcasm. And then he begins to point out his challenges, uh, the sufferings, the challenges of Christian ministry. Verses 9 through 13. He says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. 
For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world and the obscuring of all things until now. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, look, I want you to understand something. That as ministers of God, we have gone through so much of hardship so that you could be blessed. You are enriched. You are blessed. Uh, you are honored. Uh, you have all these wonderful things going on amongst you. But here's what we've gone through in order to make that possible for you. So here's something important for you and me. We must be willing to sacrifice, to go through challenges and hardships in serving people so that they can be enriched and strengthened. Are you with me? You know, sometimes we think Christian ministry is easy. Man, you get to go on these airplanes, you get to stay in nice hotels and all of that. You don't understand that sometimes there is a lot of sacrifice that goes in. And people don't see that. The sacrifice that goes in in order to bless people's lives, in order to enrich others' lives, in order to strengthen them in the Lord. People don't see the sacrifice that goes on uh, behind the scenes. And here Paul is, is referring to his own life as, a, as an apostle of Christ. Uh, and, and the truth is he traveled about 10,000 miles on road, 3,000 miles on ship. And uh, many times he faced shipwreck, he was beaten, he was chased out of town. Uh, and like he mentions, there have been times when he was uh, without a home, place to stay, uh, even with a proper food to eat. So he says, look, I've gone through all this so that you, Corinthians, you could enjoy what you're enjoying. And he is actually preparing to say something more. He's saying, look, we've done all that. And then he says... Verse 14 through 21, he talks to them as a spiritual father, and he addresses them as spiritual children. Let's read those verses, and we will draw some insights from them. Verses 14, 21, he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills. And I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? So Paul is writing to them and he reminds them, look, I am your spiritual father and you are my beloved children. So he doesn't say you're my children, you're my beloved children. It means I love you dearly, right? And I am speaking to you from that perspective. I'm speaking to you as a spiritual father. Because I have brought you to faith, uh, uh, to Christ, through the gospel. So he's speaking to them as a spiritual father. But from this passage, I want to highlight a few things about what um, a, a true spiritual father is. You see, uh, all of us should grow up to become fathers and mothers in the house of God. None of us have the privilege of remaining babies in God's kingdom forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> None of us have that privilege. We're all born into the kingdom as babies, spiritually speaking. But we have to grow. God wants us to become sons and daughters. And he wants us eventually to grow up to become fathers and mothers in his kingdom, in his house. So that we are able to nurture other people. 
And from this passage, I just want to highlight some of the things uh, that we can see about a spiritual father and a mother. Number one, a spiritual father or mother, somebody who's, uh, who's in that capacity, is one who not only births people into the kingdom through the gospel, but takes them from immaturity to maturity, which includes warning them, correcting them, as Paul was doing. So, everybody can parent, but to be a father and mother takes a lot more effort. To be a father and a mother, you take somebody from a place of immaturity to a place of maturity. And part of that is you deal with them as Paul was dealing. He was warning them. He was admonishing them. He was correcting them. Because all of this he was doing in order to mature them. That was what was in his heart. Are you with me? So a spiritual father is somebody who looks at how can I mature this person. How can I take this person up to a place of maturity uh, and not just birth them into the kingdom of God. Number two, a spiritual father recognizes and allows sons and daughters to receive instruction, nurture, training, and equipping through other true ministers of God. This is verse 15. Paul says, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have only one father, I have begotten you. But notice he's not saying, don't listen to those other instructors. That's not what he's saying. He's saying he acknowledges the fact there are many others who have given into their lives. Though he, has, he is the one who's brought them into the kingdom. Are you with me so far? So a true spiritual father and mother will encourage their sons and daughters to receive spiritual input, impartation, equipping, empowering through other ministers of God as well. True ministers of God. Because the moment you find a spiritual father or mother speak like this, saying, don't receive from anyone else except me. You've got to be careful. It's a red flag. It's a sign of a cult. It's a sign of somebody wanting to control. But a true spiritual father mother says, you're welcome to receive from other people who can instruct you, who can build you up, who can strengthen you. Are you with me? So a true spiritual father and mother does not hinder their sons and daughters from receiving from other people. Number three. This is verse 16. A spiritual father, mother, sets the examples and calls his sons and daughters to imitate him or her. Right? He says in verse 16, imitate me. See, some fathers may say, hey, your mom, do what she says, but don't do what she does. Or it could be the other way. Mom says, hey, your dad, do what he says, but don't do what he does. And that's not being a good dad or a good mom. Right? A father and mother would say, a true spiritual father and mother says, do what I do. Follow my example. Look at me. Look at my life. Do what I do. And that's what Paul is saying there in verse uh, 16. So what can we say about true spiritual fathers and mothers? They set the example. They live first and then they tell the sons and daughters, follow my footsteps. Do what I do. Are you with me so far? Are you all going to sleep yet? The fourth thing, a spiritual father, mother, raise up sons and daughters who are able to carry out the same work that they have received from their spiritual father, mother. And you see Paul writing this about Timothy in verse 17. He says, you know, Timothy, he's able to teach everything that I've been teaching in all the other churches. So I'm sending Timothy. He's a true son in the faith. That means Timothy had now come into the place where he could do the work of the ministry the way the apostle Paul was doing. Are you with me? So a true spiritual father, mother, raises up sons and daughters saying, hey, you can do it. You can be as good as me. You can be better than me. And that's the heart of every parent. They want their sons and daughters, every father, mother, they want their sons and daughters to rise up, become better, as good as them, or even better than them. The fifth one here is a spiritual father or mother knows when to use a rod for loving correction and when to deal with love and gentleness. So Paul is saying, do you want me to come with the rod of correction? Do you want me to come with gentleness? So he knows how to deal with them. So, uh, you know, if a, a, a spiritual father or mother is only giving out gentleness all the time, you'll have spoiled sons and daughters. You won't have sons and daughters who understand maturity. 
But they use the rod. They know when to use the rod to discipline, to correct, to take out what shouldn't be there so that they can have mature sons and daughters. That's a true spiritual father, mother. Are you with me? So the call here, which I want to extend to all of us is, look, we need to grow up to become fathers and mothers in the house of God. If you've stayed with me till the end of chapter 4, say amen. Amen. Good. Let's go to chapter 5. Uh, we'll do this quickly. In chapter 5, Paul addresses the second major issue in the local church at Corinth. The issue of sexual immorality. So he's got news that this has been going on in the local church there. And so he's going to address it. And uh, we can learn a lot from here, from this chapter, how he addresses it. I've broken this chapter into three sections. Action, again, sin in the local church, verses 1 of 5. Uh, the unleavened bread and the Passover lamb, verses 6 through 8, that Paul draws uh, instruction from. And verses 9 to 13 are relating to those in willful sin. We'll do this quickly. And then we'll close up by asking the question, what about grace? So, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 5. Paul writes, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed as absent in the body but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when you are gathered together along with my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, strong passage. So what's happening here? There is a man in the Corinthian church. Continuing and willful sexual sin. And so Paul says, hey, I've heard of this. That there's a man in your, in your congregation who's, who's living in this kind of a sin. And it's so shameful. Now the Jews, the Jewish believers, they knew from the Old Testament scripture that this Directly they knew this was wrong. God said this is wrong. And he said it is so shameful that it is even the Gentiles, they wouldn't approve of it. This is verse 1. So, yeah, I mean, Jews, you know it's wrong. It's written in your scriptures. The Gentiles, even the Gentiles would be ashamed to say that something like this was happening. And he says in verse 2, but you are so proud. You have not done anything about this. So we don't know what they were really proud about. Maybe they were proud about, you know, how spiritual they were. God is still moving in our midst, so this is okay. Let it go. Because we know that about the Corinthian church. He said, you know, they come short and no gift. Maybe they were proud about the fact that they were so gracious to this man. They let him continue. Or we don't know what they were proud about. But he says, look, the fact that you haven't done anything about this, you are puffed up. You're proud about this. And he says, in verse 2, you should have grieved. You should have been mournful uh, that such a thing was happening amongst you. And you should have acted quickly to put this man out of the church. That's verse 2. Then he says in verse 3, but though I'm absent. Now Paul was in Ephesians at the time and he was writing this. He says, though I'm absent, meaning I'm not there in Corinth physically. I have already judged this person. I've taken what I can do. So Paul had spiritual authority to, uh, you know, to judge this person. So in the spirit, he's already judged him. Now in verses 4 and 5, he's telling the local congregation to carry out his judgment. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you're doing it on behalf of the, of the Lord, in his name, by his authority, in his place. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you gather together, along with my spirit. That means I'm also with you in spirit. With the power of the Lord Jesus, I mean, God is backing you up in this. The power of God is present when you're gathering together in the name of the Lord. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to deliver this person to Satan. 
far the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved. What is Paul meaning here? How do you deliver somebody to Satan? I mean, what's his address anyway? <laughs> How do you, you know, which package, you know, FedEx, FedEx him to Satan, you know? How do you deliver somebody to Satan? What's he talking about? And what does it mean, the destruction of the flesh? What does that mean? So we'll understand that. So really what Paul is saying, he mentioned this in verse 2. He's saying, you should have put him out of the church. So to deliver somebody to Satan, it really is you're putting that person out of the local church. So that because of his own willful, unrepentant, uh, ongoing sin. That means he's not willing to change. Right? See, we all make mistakes. We all don't get kicked out of the church. That's what we're talking about. You know, we all make mistakes. We're not, we're not talking about that. But this man is in continual sin, unashamed, unrepentant, willful, sinning. So you've got to deal with that. You can't tolerate that. So what do you do? You put him out of the local church. In so doing, you're putting him out of the spiritual protection of the local body of believers. And so, he in effect becomes vulnerable to whatever the Satan wants to do in his life. Are you with me? So what it means to deliver somebody to Satan means you're taking them out of the spiritual protection of the local church body over him. Because that's what he mentions in verse 2. Okay, out of fellowship. Put him out. So that now the enemy can do whatever he wants to do. And this is going to happen because of his own willful sinning. His own rebellion. His own unrepentant sinning. It's going to happen. What does he mean by the destruction of the flesh? Now the word flesh in the New Testament, and both in Paul's writings and other places, is used in very different contexts. Now let me just enumerate to you the different ways in which the word flesh is used. Uh, sometimes the word is flesh is used just to refer to people. God says, I will pour out my spirit in all flesh, meaning... All people. The word flesh is used to refer to the physical body. Uh, this physical body that dies. So that's, that's another way the word flesh is used. The word flesh is also used to refer to uh, the natural uh, earthly happenings. The things uh, that we have. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 7, and we'll look at this later on. In 1 Corinthians 7, 28, Paul says, all those who are married, listen up. Paul says, those who get married will have trouble in the flesh. Now, does that mean they'll have trouble in the flesh, meaning they'll fall sick? That's all he's meaning. Those who are married will face challenges in the daily happenings, and day-to-day things of life. So the word flesh is used in that context. Are you with me? Right? To talk about the natural happening, the day-to-day challenges, things of life. So the word flesh is used there. The word flesh, of course, is used to deal with the ungodly desires of the body. So Galatians 5 talks about it. There are evil inclinations of the body. Uh, the, the word flesh is also used in that context. So the word flesh in the New Testament is used in various different contexts. So now Paul says, deliver such a person to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What does that mean? In the context of what we see in the New Testament, it simply means that the enemy, Satan, is going to have access to cause him trouble in his natural earthly life. Are you with me? It's going to destruction. And the purpose of it is hopefully he'll come back to his senses. That's what you do. Now, there's only one other occasion where Paul repeated the same thing of delivering somebody to Satan. This is in 1 Timothy chapter 1. There were two men in the Ephesian church, uh, Hymenius and Alexander. They were two believers, but they came up with this wrong idea saying the, the resurrection is already over. You guys missed it. So they started preaching that, and it troubled so many, and they began to oppose Paul. They began to blaspheme the gospel. They made shipwreck of their faith, as Paul points out. And so Paul says, these two guys, I have delivered them to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. So here again, the same action Paul took by his spiritual authority, right? There's only two cases. He didn't deliver every sinner, every person who sinned to Satan, right? There were 
two, only two occasions of a serious offense in the church that Paul dealt in this manner. That means he took away that spiritual protection over their life so that now Satan could cause them problems in their natural day-to-day -day life. And hopefully that would bring them to a place of repentance. Are you with me so far? Okay. The actual judgment itself is not mentioned. Paul didn't say deliver him to Satan so he'll have boils in his flesh. That's not what he said. He said let Satan trouble him in the natural things of life. And hopefully he'll come to his senses and he will come back to the faith. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Uh, in in this, this person's life. Uh, we find uh, later on in chapter in 2 Corinthians, this man repented. And so Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians to bring him back into fellowship. Uh, because he repented of his wrongdoing. What I want to point out here is this. That all Christian discipline must be done with repentance, restoration, and edification as the goal. It is never for uh, the total destruction of the person. No. The goal is I want them to repent. I want them to come back. Are you with me so far? Right? Now let's finish off that chapter there. The last few verses. Uh, sorry, two more passages there. Verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little, little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven. Not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is Paul doing now? He's referring back to the Old Testament scripture. He's referring back to the Jewish culture, the Jewish uh, uh, customs. The Jews had two feasts, or seven feasts that they kept every year, major feasts. At the beginning of every year, in, the, in their first month, the month of Nisan, which usually happened in the March, April of our English calendar... The first month in the Jewish calendar, the month of Nisan, on the 14th day of that month was the feast of the Passover. That's where they killed the Passover lamb. They sacrificed the Passover. And right after that, the next seven days was the feast of unleavened bread. They ate unleavened bread for seven days. The feast of the Passover, as you will remember, was the day they were brought out of Egypt. And the first Passover was killed. That was the day of their deliverance. Or the night of their deliverance. And God said the next seven days is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You don't put any leaven in your bread. So in preparation to these two feasts. The Feast of the Passover Lamb and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In preparation to that, what every Jewish home did was. They removed all leaven, all yeast, all uh, fermented bread. All leavened bread was taken out. The house, whole house was cleaned out. Are you with me? So that's what Paul was saying. He's saying, now take out the leaven from the, so that you can be a completely new lump. Like a new lump of dough that has no leaven in it. Take out that old leaven. Clean out the house. Because a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. A little leaven, a little thing in, can, can, in, can affect the whole lump of dough. So he says, deal with this sin. Take it out before the whole church community gets affected. Clean out the house. Because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So he's saying, look, for us, the reality, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. He was sacrificed for us. So we are keeping this feast, so to speak. And he says, so now let's keep the feast. You and I are living in a perpetual feast of unleavened bread. That means there is no ease, no wickedness, no sin to be in us. Are you understanding? So we are living in a perpetual, continuous feast of unleavened bread. And he says, that's who you are. For you indeed truly are unleavened. God has separated us, taken us out of the world. He's making, made us unleavened. Made too much sin out of us. He says, that's who we truly are. We are living like this. So now he says, in the local church, I want you to do this quickly. Take out the yeast and uh, let us be that lump that is clean. Are you with me? And then the last few verses of this chapter, we close. Verses 9 through 13. 
I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortionists or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are, all, who are also, who also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside God judges. Therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. You know, these, this is very strong. To deal with sin in this manner. Where Paul says, look, you've got, if a person is continuing uh, an unrepentant, willful, rebellious sin in the church, whatever it is, not just sexual immorality, kind of adds to that list. He says, what do you need to do? You need to put that person out. And have no, com uh, he says, you know, no company, meaning don't mix up, don't mingle together with them. But of course, this has to be put in light with other instructions. Now, I'll just point to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Paul, again, to the Thessalonians, writes this. He says, if anyone does not obey our word in this episode, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So the whole purpose in dealing in such discipline is so that uh, he... He may be ashamed, he may come back to his senses, he may be restored. All right? So even this change in our uh, relational dynamics with that person because of his willful sinning, that change that I can no longer mix with you and fellowship with you as I would normally used to, that change in dynamic is in order for him to be ashamed, in order for him to realize what he's doing is wrong and to be brought back into proper fellowship with the house of God. Are you with me? Those who understood, say amen. amen. <laughs> so in closing, what about grace? You know, the Apostle Paul is the one who taught us about grace. I mean, in fact, in all of his other epistles, he writes about the grace of God. He says, we have received abundance of grace. What about grace? He, not, he, meant, he never mentions grace even once in this whole chapter. Well, we need to understand that grace always comes with her twin brother named Truth. The Bible says grace and truth came to us through Jesus Christ. So truth is the other side of the same coin of grace. So the grace of God is always administered in truth. Truth also has to be established. If we overlook truth in the name of grace, it is not the grace of God. It is some other grace. On the flip side, truth is always ministered with grace. If truth is not ministered with grace, then it is not truth. It is something else. Are you understanding? The grace and truth goes together. That means we have to call sin, sin. We have to discipline where discipline is needed. Grace does not displace divine discipline. Grace is accompanied with divine discipline. That is the grace of God. And that discipline comes in such a manner that, the, that people are given the opportunity to be restored. Grace and truth. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. Thank you for your patience. I know this is heavy stuff to hear, but this is in the word of God for you and me as believers. I want us to take a few moments just to uh, respond to what we've heard this morning. And we'll pray and close. How do we view servants of God? They are servants, they are stewards. Let God judge them. We all have to guard the motives of our hearts because God judges us according to the motives of our hearts. Why do you do what you do? 
Understand there is sacrifice involved if you want to serve God, you want to serve His people, you want to enrich their lives. There is sacrifice involved. You and I may not be shipwrecked like the Apostle Paul, but our sacrifices today may be different, but there are sacrifices. Understand what it means to be a true spiritual father or mother. Grow into that and be a spiritual father or mother to people. If there is sin in the house of God, it has to be dealt with. When we stand in good fellowship with God and with His house, with His local body, we are under a divine protection. We are divinely protected. So our attitude towards the house of God, our attitude towards the church should be something that recognizes the protection of God that's over us because we live in right relationship with Him and with His house, with His local church. So Father, this morning, even as we have spoken Your Word, I ask that by Your Holy Spirit, You'll work in each one of us so that the word that has been heard will bring transformation in our lives. That it will encourage, that it will strengthen, that it will bring correction, that it will bring alignment. That God, that it will bring deliverance. That God, that it will also bring healing and wholeness into our lives. So, Father, we ask that this will take place in each of us who heard your word this morning because of the accompanying power of your Holy Spirit. Let healing take place in our hearts, in our minds, in our emotions, and even in our bodies because your word comes with your power. Let every work of the enemy be broken. Let every assignment of the enemy be canceled. Let every scheme of the enemy be rendered powerless in our lives. Because you stand watch over each one of us. And we thank you, Lord. And we bless you. Thank you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.